It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Feldstein to you. Nearly everything I taught you uh, last week about Social Security I learned from Professor Feldstein, and that's not just me. Nearly everything the economic profession knows about Social Security people learned from, from uh, Martin Feldstein. Um, professor Feldstein is the George F. Baker Professor of Economics at Harvard University, and in that capacity teaches what is the largest course at Harvard College, Economics 10. Um, he's also the president of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He was chairman of President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors from 1982 to 1984, and in that capacity was involved in the previous Social Security reform um, that happened in 1983. Professor Feldstein has received many awards, including in 1977 the prestigious John Bates Clark Medal of the American Economic Association, given every two years to the best economist under the age of 40. Professor Feldstein's writings over the past 30 years have fundamentally changed how economic policy is done, uh, particularly fiscal policy, both in Washington and around the world. If you go back and read, for example, the New York Times coverage of a budget debate from the 1970s, something I'm sure you all do quite frequently. Um, if you go back and, and, and read that, you'll be, sort of, you'll, you'll be very surprised at what's going on when people talk about tax policy or, or, or budget policy. The whole debate is about short-term, uh, the effects of government policy on short-term macroeconomic uh, um, trends. There's no discussion of the impact of government policy on labor supply, savings, or long-term growth. Um, Professor Feldstein's research, including the paper that we discussed of his last week uh, um, about the effect of Social Security on savings, and also the paper you discussed in API 102 two weeks ago about the impact of uh, income taxes on taxable income, um, have been fundamental in, in, in changing the focus of economic policy um, to, to, to issues of incentives and, and of economic growth. And, and, and this has led a quiet, quiet revolution in economic thought, both in the United States and around the world. And as Professor Feldstein has followed his ideas around the world, um, he's learned a lot about social security systems around the world. And today he's going to tell, share with us something about what he, he has learned about what other countries are doing about social security and what that says for the U.S. social security reform debate. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was so nice. I'm sorry to hear it come to an end. Um, but I am delighted to be able to participate in this program uh, and very pleased that you've been studying Social Security. I, I think it is the most important fiscal issue, probably the most important policy issue facing the country. And so having all of you working on it for a couple of weeks intensively can't be a bad thing. And I know you've been studying the problems with the existing U.S. system and looking at some of the options for reform. When uh, Jeff asked if I'd like to talk, uh, we talked about what I might do today, and I thought I would do two things. One is to try to put some of the U.S. reform discussion in an international context by looking very briefly and sort of schematically uh, at what's happening in other countries around the world. And then second, to discuss a proposal of my own, not all that different in spirit, although different in some important details from the one that Senator Moynihan uh, talked about yesterday. But I think the part of this that I'm looking forward to most is hearing your questions, because I rarely get a chance to get questions from people who have done the kind of intensive study of the subject of Social Security that you all have in the last 10 days or so. So let me, uh, can't be an economist without writing on a board, let me do a little writing on the board. All I want to do is to classify, is to classify different kinds of Social Security systems that are being adopted around the world according to the nature of the benefits and the nature of the financing. So the benefits can be in terminology that I'm sure everybody here knows. Uh, well, what to do, okay? I've got a better idea. I'll stand here and I'll talk and then I'll go over and write for a second. Okay, that's fine. I'm sure you all know the terminology of defined benefits and defined contributions. And that's an important distinction as we think about the way in which programs are organized. 
And the other important distinction is between pay-as-you-go systems and investment-based systems. So that's what I'm going to write down. Now, as you know, the United States and most of the Western European countries now have a defined benefit pay-as-you-go system. Just put the U.S. up there, but it's the U.S. and Western Europe. What that means is that the government promises benefits in some relation to past earnings or past contributions and that's financed, that's the defined benefit part, so it's not based on an amount that the individual accumulates in an account, but rather on some earnings record or years of employment. And the pay-as-you-go part means that it's financed by concurrent taxes, and that essentially is the system we have now. We have a relatively small trust fund, but the basic idea is a pay-as-you-go system. And that has led, as you know, to some serious problems. Basically, today, in order to operate that pay-as-you-go system at the level of benefits that society wants to give to retirees, to operate that system requires a payroll tax uh, equal to 12% of covered earnings. And that has two adverse effects. It means that there are high marginal tax rates distorting the way labor markets operate, distorting, in other words, labor supply decisions broadly defined, not just how many hours people work or uh, whether they participate at all, but also affecting the kinds of jobs people take, where they locate, how much effort, how much education, human capital they acquire. And in addition to those labor supply effects, there are also important effects on the form of, of compensation, whether I get paid in taxable cash or I get paid in fringe benefits like a nice office in the Kennedy School. That's the situation today, and we know that that situation is going to get worse because of the aging of the population. And it's not merely a matter of the baby boomers, but rather the fact that Longevity is increasing everywhere in the world, and that in the United States, the actuaries tell us that over the next uh, 50 years or so, that's going to take the current 12% up to more than 16%, and eventually to an 18% payroll tax to finance benefits which have the same relation to past earnings as benefits do today. So that means that whatever the current problems are, high marginal tax rates that distort and a high cost of buying retirement consumption will be that much worse, will be 50% worse as we go from a 12% tax to an 18% tax. If we look in Europe, the situation is worse. And it's worse for several reasons. It's worse first because typically the benefits are higher in Europe. They allow earlier retirement. They have higher ratios of benefits to past earnings. And so even today, the payroll tax required to finance benefits in those countries is typically higher than 12%. Second, those taxes come on top of higher taxes in general, since, as you know, the distortion, the deadweight loss that results from marginal tax rates increases with the square of the overall tax rate. That has the implication that adding a 12% payroll tax on top of a, say, 15% income tax, as in the US, or a 28% income tax, as in the US, will do less damage than adding it on top of a 40 or 50% tax, as we see in some countries in Europe. And finally, a number of the European countries are aging faster so that the relative cost is rising even more quickly than here. And so there's a very active search for new options. It's very much in flux. Some countries have taken the lead, have actually adopted new plans. Others are just talking about it. I went in 
December to the OECD in Paris for a meeting that brought together all of the OECD countries. And it was very interesting to hear the representatives of those countries talk about some of the ideas that they're thinking about and some that they're actually putting into practice. One idea that I thought I'd start with is a little unusual in comparison to the things that you've actually been looking at, and that is a defined contribution pay-as-you-go system. And that's actually been adopted in Italy and in Sweden. And we tend to think of defined contribution systems as being like 401k plans or IRA plans where you put money in, you invest them in stocks and bonds, and you take the returns out in the end based on the increase in the value of those assets. Well, what can it mean to talk about a defined contribution system that's pay as you go, meaning that doesn't accumulate a fund? Well, another name that's given to it is a notional defined contribution system. What really goes on is this. Each individual has an account. Payroll taxes that are collected from that individual are credited to the individual's account. So you get a statement that says at the beginning of the year your account had $17,000 in it. This year you've put in $3,000. And then it earns a pseudo rate of interest. It earns a rate of interest which reflects the growth of the wage base. Because as I bet you know, do they know? I bet you know uh, the implicit rate of return that can be earned in a pay-as-you-go system is equal to the rate of growth of the wage base, roughly 2%. So if you had one of these accounts in Sweden or Italy, the money that you pay into the pay-as-you-go system would be added to your notional account, and you would earn a rate of return of 2 2 2.5%, whatever it is that the actuaries estimate is the rate of growth of the wage base. And then when you retire, you can take out an annuity. And the annuity is based upon the amount that you've accumulated based on your earnings during your lifetime. You can take out an annuity based on that accumulation and an implicit rate of return during the annuity period at exactly the same rate of growth of the wage base, about 2%. In addition to that, these countries have specified that there would be a means-tested supplement on top of it. Now, these are not ideas. These are facts. This is actually happening in these countries, and it's happening immediately because the transition problems that you've no doubt talked about as you go from a pay-as-you-go system to an investment-based system don't really exist when you deal with going from one pay-as-you-go system to another pay-as-you-go system. There are no assets to begin with. There are no assets to end with. It's all done with notional arithmetic. Well, why in the world would you do it? Well, there are really three advantages of going from a defined benefit system of our sort to a defined contribution system, at least as seen by the Swedes and the Italians, who are not exactly the hard right wing of European social policy. What are they? The first is transparency. Transparency is the in word. If, if in doubt, you want to praise something, you say improves transparency. Then you figure out what it means in this context. But it's clear that central bankers want transparency. Social policy people want transparency. What does it mean in this context? It means that people understand the link between the taxes that they pay for Social Security and the benefits that they're going to get. If you ask the average American, how much did you pay in Social Security taxes last year as opposed to income taxes, probably don't get a very coherent answer. Uh, what are you going to get for those taxes? Probably don't get a coherent answer. Even if they know how much they're paying in, they don't know the very complicated formula that links that to final benefits. The advantage of a transparent defined contribution, notional defined contribution system, is that you know that the money that you pay in taxes, you and your employer, are going into an account that has your name on it, and that's going to earn a rate of return of 2%. And real. 2% isn't wonderful, but it beats zero. It beats minus infinity. It's not that you're just paying these taxes and the money is disappearing. It's going into an account 
that you will ultimately be able uh, to draw on. It's still very low, so there still are labor market distortions, but the idea is that by being transparent in this way, those distortions will be less. A second virtue that the Italians and Swedes point to is that it eliminates the distortions in favor of early retirement. You decide when you want to retire, and you have an account that is actuarially fair at this nominal interest rate. And finally, and I think this is the really important reason that this has been adopted, it allows the governments to put a ceiling on the future growth of taxes in a rather, um, do I dare say, devious way. Instead of saying we're going to cut future benefits, what they say is we're going to stabilize the tax contribution rate. So if we put it in U.S. terms, we would be saying, well, the tax contribution rate now is 12 percent. For the retirement program, we're going to stabilize it at 12 percent. We're going to put 12 percent of your wages into your account, and you will then get whatever 12 percent earns during your lifetime. And if that turns out to be less than was implicitly promised in the previous Social Security legislation, the pay-as-you-go defined benefit legislation, well, that's just the way it worked out. I think that's a large part of what is driving this, because these countries are looking at much higher rates and don't want to see a 50 percent increase as their populations age. And so what they're really doing is canceling some of the future benefit growth that would otherwise occur. Okay, let me shift from that to the defined contribution funded systems. These are the big reform systems that you've heard much about, particularly in Latin America, starting with Chile. Mexico. Others. Here, individuals actually contribute to accounts that are invested in stocks and bonds by replacing a 2% rate of return with a real rate of return on stocks and bonds, which might be 5, 5 6%, 6%. The result is to dramatically, in the long run, when these are fully phased in, dramatically reduce uh, the cost of financing retirement. And you've been through all that, I know, so I can uh, avoid going over it. What it means is less labor market distortion, if any, uh, and l much lower costs of paying for retirement consumption. I think that it's a very promising idea. I think that the transition from a pay-as-you-go system of the sort we have to a system like that can't be done overnight, shouldn't be done by going to recognition bonds as in Chile, where the system was widely perceived as bankrupt, corrupt, to be thrown away. Uh, here, I think there is a sense in the broad public that Social Security works, and we need to, as the President said, and as uh, Senator Moynihan said the other day, save Social Security, and that means a gradual transition. And it wouldn't surprise me if you've seen some of the stuff I've done on that, but given the limits of time, I don't want to spend more time on it. That leaves us with one remaining box over here, a defined benefit funded system. And there the idea would be to raise taxes and you, or use the budget surplus that has been projected and take those dollars and put them into the existing trust fund and use them to finance the defined benefits that are called for in current law. In principle, the macroeconomics of that could be the same as the macroeconomics of a defined contribution with individual accounts. But I think in practice, it would turn out very differently. What would happen if the current projected budget surpluses of about 1% of GDP starting in the year 2002, <clears throat> if those budget surpluses were transferred in an accounting sense into the Social Security Trust Fund? My guess is that when the dust settled, the Congress, the White House, whoever was there at the time would say, that's money that we can spend just as we can spend the money that is currently in the trust fund. Uh, it doesn't represent a, a, um, a loss of funds, of spending or ta uh, taxing power on the part of the government. It would show, except for perhaps a technical matter, as a big surplus in the unified budget. And if the 
national uh, budget accountants found a way to claim that it wasn't, I suspect someone would come up with a new term that brought that money back in to something called a super unified budget so that it would be available uh, to be spent. So I think in the end it would not add to national savings in the same way as individual accounts would. I think what it would do would be to fundamentally change the role of the government in the economy. Uh, as the government then became responsible for allocating these funds. And I thought Pat Moynihan put it far better than I could when he said doing that, he said in his lecture here uh, yesterday, doing that would be simply a disaster. That giving the Senate Finance Committee the power to allocate those funds would lead to all kinds of things that we would rather not see. He didn't spell them out, but I could certainly imagine that just as the defense budget has to be spent in every, every county, every congressional district in America, that those portfolios will have to be invested in every county and every congressional district uh, in America. That restrictions would be put on them so that the funds aren't invested in companies that do business in countries that we don't like, or in companies that produce products that we don't like, in other words, the government would be dealing with what for openers in a few years would be a trillion dollar portfolio in ways that I at least agree with Pat Moynihan would be a disaster. So there are these four basic types. And then there's something else. And I think the something else is where we're going. And that something else is a hybrid, is a mixture of these two. That would have to be true during a long period of transition anyway. But even apart from transition issues, it's an idea that is appealing in a number of countries. Australia, for example, created a large, or had for a long time, a large defined benefit pay-as-you-go system. And then they added on top of it a defined contribution investment-based system. Sweden has just decided to go in the same direction. In, for their pay-as-you-go part, it all is a defined contribution pay-as-you-go system. But 2.5% of the total payroll tax in Sweden will go into individual accounts where the individuals will be able to choose how they want them invested, stocks, bonds, insurance companies, bank deposits, and will continue to have the, the backup of a pay-as-you-go system for most of their retirement income, but at the same time will have a, um, uh, a defined contribution system for part with the advantages of a high rate of return that that produces. Now, I've been thinking about that idea, about a small pay-as-you-go system to use the existing budget surpluses and I'd like to take a couple of minutes before I open up for questions just to describe that. The kind of idea that I've had in mind, remember we're, we're looking at budget surpluses starting in a couple of years that the administration and the Congressional Budget Office predict will be on the order of 1% of GDP. And my feeling is that if nothing else is done, those budget surpluses are going to disappear. They're going to be spent or they're going to be given in tax cuts that are going to lead individuals to go and spend the money, and that would be a great shame, that there's an opportunity here to secure retirements, to lower future payroll taxes, uh, and to increase national saving. How would I do it? I'd allow each individual to put 2% of their taxable earnings up to the Social Security maximum into a new kind of individual retirement account. Let me call it a personal retirement account to distinguish it from the other individual IRAs that are floating around. You put 2% of your earnings into the account, and then you get a tax credit, you get a tax credit on the income tax equal dollar for dollar for the amount that you put in. So if you make $40,000, you put $800 into your personal retirement account, and you get a tax credit of $800, so it costs you nothing. And if you don't pay $800 in personal income taxes, it's refundable, the government writes you a check. So it literally costs you nothing. So it's free to the individual, and although I would make it voluntary, if it's free, 
and you end up with an account that has your name on it and money in it, it's hard to see that there are going to be many people who wouldn't uh, rush to take it. The cost of that 2% of payroll, given that payroll is about 40% of GDP, is 2% or 40% or 8 tenths of a percent of GDP, and therefore is less than the projected budget surpluses. 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but if you start saving at age 30 and you save to age 65, and I'm talking now about real dollars, so if you have a couple and they each make $30,000, when they reach age 65, in today's prices, they would have accumulated $125,000. And that would be enough to finance a, an annuity at about $10,000 a year. All of that assumes a rate of return equal to the historic average after-tax rate of return, after corporate tax, I should say, rate of return, uh, on a portfolio of stocks and bonds. It's not just stocks, it's a mixture of stocks and bonds. And the historic record, excluding the last few years of uh, fairy tale rates of return, the historic record is 5.5% real rate of return. So if you put 2% of your payroll in, and you, you and your spouse each earn $30,000, you did that from age 30 to 65, what you would have at the end is $125,000, enough to buy an annuity for the rest of your life of about $10,000 a year. I think there's an even better way of using the funds, though, and that is to require individuals who have opened up these personal retirement accounts and put the money in, which essentially costs them nothing, when they go to take it out, for every dollar that they take out, they would lose some Social Security benefits. I call it integrating it with Social Security. So in the case of a 50% integration, for every dollar you take out of your personal retirement account, your Social Security benefits go down by 50 cents. You're still 50 cents richer than you would be without this program, which cost you nothing. But what does it do to the Social Security program? It means that instead of the trust fund running out in 2030, and the tax rate having to go up to 18% eventually, it means that the tax rate would only have to go up to 14%. Now, you say, hey, if 50% integration does that, maybe slightly higher integration can do even better things. And you're right. If we had a 75% integration, in other words, when you went to take your money out, for every dollar that you took out, your Social Security benefits went down by 75 cents, which, by the way, would still leave you better off than if you didn't have this scheme, would still leave you better off because you're still getting the full amount of your Social Security benefits plus something. With a 75% integration, the trust fund would never run out and the tax rate could stay at 12.4%. You'd never have to have an increase in the tax rate. That seems to me to be a very attractive proposition, a very good use of the... Um, projected surpluses over the next 10 or 15 years. So when I look at these options, although I can see the attractiveness of ending up in that lower box, I think if that's going to happen, it's going to happen way off in the future. In the shorter term, I think having a pay-as-you-go system wouldn't be bad if we moved it over into a more transparent one. Having a pay-as-you-go system and combining it with a small 2% funded system would be very desirable because it would reduce future tax rates, increase national savings, and increase the retirement income of the aging. Well, let me stop there and see if I've provoked any questions, either on the basis of this or other things that people have read. Yes, sir. In the, uh... <clears throat> The uh, contribution system, is the money uh, that's collected or essentially deposited in the IRA accounts available to the government as it is now with the trust fund for spending in its operating budget? <clears throat> Not really. They would have no more access to it than they now have access to the capital market in general. So they wouldn't have a favored position. Mm -hmm. in, in these personal accounts, it's your account. You put the money in it the way you do an IRA or a 401K. 
then might it be possible uh, for the uh, people who own the uh, IRAs to lend the money back to the government in the sure, if they want to buy government bonds, bonds they want to buy government 7%. bonds with it they can do that but they don't have to that's mm -hmm. the difference from the current uh, current system what you're getting is a two-page summary um, of about the things that I've just been talking about about the two percent plan and the integration yes I recently read your article on uh, the effect of net national savings of having a pay-as-you-go system and my question is that admittedly there is a large loss of savings but if we were to go to a fully funded or even a three-quarters fully funded system um, putting all that additional capital on the market is calculated to have some significant positive effects the problem is if you have less consumption a lot of those extra developments will uh, not be able to sell their products and it has to do with where you stand as a country um, in terms of your balance of consumption and savings and what makes you think that we're in the right place uh, I think we're at the wrong place I think we have much too much consumption relative to savings. If you look around the world, we are way off the distribution with, a, uh, with savings as a share of GDP in the United States of only about 5%. Uh, others manage to make good use of savings of 10%, uh, 12%, 15%, turning it into more investment in plant and equipment, a better housing stock, higher real growth. I think we could do that. I don't see any, any conceivable reason why we couldn't. Are you waiting? Yeah. You're on. Okay. Uh, my name is Saskia Riley, and I'm a student here. Um, we had a question, maybe if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the intermediate assumptions that um, behind the projection that the trust fund will become insolvent and that Social Security as it is today is doomed to failure? Well, it's not doomed to failure. I mean, I think all that, just among friends here, uh, all that is very helpful because it focuses Washington's attention on the issue. Uh, it's because we have an earmarked tax system that the trust fund is so important. If you ask, what about our defense budget or our biomedical research budget? They have no trust funds, but we don't think that they're going to be unable to spend next year. So I think one can exaggerate the problem. But now on the sort of technical point of whether the Social Security Actuary's intermediate assumption is right that uh, we're going to uh, see uh, benefits grow and at a rapid rate relative to taxes. Most of that for the relatively near term is pretty certain. It's pretty certain in the sense that uh, we know the population. There aren't going to be radical changes over the next 10 or 15 years in mortality rates. There may be um, uh, changes in retirement patterns and that's what has caused the past assumptions of the Social Security Administration to turn out to be too optimistic. People have been retiring sooner than was anticipated. Looking to the longer term, though, I think the intermediate assumptions are probably, from what I gather talking to demographers, too optimistic. Uh, optimistic as only an economist would use the term. Uh, they assume that people, that mortality rates are not going to keep improving at the rate that they have in the past, but that the rate of progress is going to slow down dramatically. And if that doesn't happen, if the kind of story we saw the other day in the newspaper about cancer rates falling because we're all eating our broccoli and doing those good things, uh, if that becomes the norm, then the Social Security projections are too pessimistic and the pay-as-you-go thing will cost more than 18% in the long run. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yes. Hi, my name is Josh Lippert. I'm a first-year student also. Some of us were wondering, um, you were talking about the personal accounts. We wanted to know um, who or what organizations would be managing those funds and what the transaction costs for that might be. The, um, again, there are a variety of possibilities. People have different views about it. You heard that Senator Moynihan's view was that it would be managed by the federal thrift plan, which is currently 
a, which is a government organization that currently manages uh, 401k kinds of contributions for federal employees. That's a much, much smaller operation than if you get everybody in the country contributing. Uh, my thought is that we now have, in this country, fortunately, a very well-developed system of capital markets, um, very efficient provision of those kind of services in IRAs and 401ks, uh, and that I would assume that we would allow anybody who is currently a provider of 401k or IRA kinds of plans, or anybody who could qualify for that, a bank, a mutual fund, an insurance company, uh, would be able to offer this. What are the costs? Some people have looked at the Chilean experience and thrown up their hands and said, look how expensive it is. I think the Chileans went out of their way to design it to be extra expensive uh, by a variety of regulations which gave no advantage to keeping costs down and big advantages to bribing people, inducing people by gifts and sales and so on to move from one account to the other. There's a lot of turnover uh, as people collect toasters and bicycles, uh, and very little uh, efficiency in the delivery of the services. Here, if you want to open up a Vanguard account and put your money in an indexed fund like the Fortune 500, you can do it for about uh, 40 basis points, a little less than one half of 1%. And I have talked to some of the people in the mutual fund industry and asked them, can you do this with the kind of small accounts? And their answer is, they think these will be long-term accounts. This is long-term business. So yes, you lose money the first year or so because it takes some effort to set up the account, but in the long run, they'll be able to do it for these kinds of, of fees. Some people are gonna wanna have more managed accounts rather than just an index fund, and it'll cost a little bit more. But I think the difference between the rate of return that individuals and society can get on real investments and the 2% pay-as-you-go rate of return is so much bigger than any of these administrative costs that it just swamps the administrative cost uh, issue. Thank you. Ah, I can't see the people in the back. There's somebody, right. Hi, my name's da David Pinto, and I'm an MPP1. Professor Feldstein, could you tell us what the effect on the stock market would be of all, all of this ex ex extra capital coming in? Our group's been quite, quite worried that this could actually lead to a massive inflation of prices as more money chases the same pool of, of blue-chip stocks, which could make, make the problem we face to, today several times worse. Well, let's think about what would happen. In the first year, how much money would go in? 2% of existing payroll, 8 tenths of a percent of GDP. So relative to our savings, it's not trivial, but it's not massive, and certainly relative to the pool of funds out there, it's tiny. So the idea that it would suddenly be this great infusion chasing a small number of stocks, no, no, you don't have to worry about that. The total value of stocks outstanding is on the order of $20 trillion. Uh, the savings that we're talking about in the first year on the order of $60 billion. So it's sort of nothing relative to the giant size pool uh, that is there. What happens over time? Over time, the capital stock itself grows. So it's not that we've got a fixed amount of capital in America and the share price value of it goes up and up and up. It's that as more money is saved, it gets borrowed or companies issue new stock. In either case, it leads to more physical accumulation of plant and equipment. And then share values will reflect that but it won't be a higher price earnings ratio. What it will be is simply a, a market valuation of this growing capital stock. S sorry, if I could just ask one sure. further question on, on that. In your article, you said that capital stock, you estimated, would increase by roughly 34%, but at the same time, you thought mm -hmm. that savings within about a 30-year timeline would increase by about 2 .3, 2, to a level of 2.3 times G GDP. Surely there's still a big... Um, unbalanced there between growth of savings and growth of capital stock? No, the numbers, uh, I remember the 30%. I don't remember the, what the other number refers to. Um, the numbers are put together in a consistent way. All I can say is trust me <laughs> that we did the arithmetic right. The, um, it is true that 75 years out into the future, this um, process of saving, much of which is the reinvestment of the funds inside the personal retirement accounts 
would grow the capital stock if there were no offsetting other changes in savings by about 30 percent. Um, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful? It would mean that real wages would be higher by about 7 or 8 percent. GDP would be higher than it would otherwise be by about 7 or 8 percent. That would be a very good thing. So I, I call that all a big plus. And of course, that whole income from that capital stock is in effect devoted to financing retirement benefits, uh, replacing the payroll tax as a method of financing retirement benefits. Just to be clear, that's moving to a fully funded system over time, not my much more humble two percentage point uh, little starter kit that I described here. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Yes, my name is Matt Sanders. Uh, wouldn't there are some that, are, that have argued that by inst instead of investing in, these, in this retirement system, if we would instead uh, invest in paying down the national debt, that we would have a greater return for our efforts uh, by paying down that debt that's been crowding out, crowding out investment, and thereby increase national savings? Wouldn't we have a long? Could we possibly have a, a, high, a greater long-term return by paying down that national debt than we would by investing in retirement? Uh, probably yes, in the following sense. <clears throat> that if you took, let's take the surpluses projected a few years out, $100 billion, 2002. If you took that $100 billion and you pay down the national debt and nothing else happened, we'd have $100 billion of crowding in of capital investment. That would be a big plus. If we put that $100 billion into personal retirement accounts, it would probably be some offsetting behavior. Some individuals would say, well, I've got that money. I'll save a little bit less. And so the net capital stock would probably go up by less than $100 billion. So if the only concern were what do we do about the size of the capital stock, and you could be sure that, paying, that the money would stay around to pay off the national debt, then that would be the better bet. My political sense is there isn't a chance in hell that that money would be there over the next 15 years, that Congress is busy thinking about ways of spending the money or giving it in tax cuts to this or that needy, politically needy, constituency. And uh, if you put that, if you commit in advance, you didn't say, well, whatever money happens to be left on the table at the end of the year, we'll put into uh, personal retirement accounts. But if you committed in advance that 2% of GDP is going to go into these accounts, that would, I think, increase national saving with much greater certainty than taking the risk that maybe Congress would have the self-control not to spend or give away that money. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Brian Klett. And um, it seems that economists have said that there's a danger that uh, public spending can crowd out private investment. I'm just wondering if the reverse situation is possible. Can private and over uh, emphasis on private spending crowd of public um, investment and in bridges and education and all those sorts of things that we we need as a nation? It can crowd it out in a political sense. I mean, if we say we don't want public services, we don't want public goods, we just want our own toys, so we're going to vote for no roads, no bridges. Because uh, we want just private goods, uh, well, then in that sense it crowds it out. But I don't see that happening. Um. Hello, Professor Feldstein. I'm Steve Schenkel. I'm one of the first year public policy students who spent the, uh, or spending the two weeks considering Social Security. And one of the things our group has looked at is the thrift savings plan and essentially a larger version of that same plan. One of the problems we keep running into is as this plan grows, if people choose to move their funds, uh, very large amounts of money are suddenly moving from an equity market into a bond market, uh, perhaps causing the equity market to crash. I wonder if there's a way to do that smoothly. Is that a problem? And even with individual funds, does that become a problem? Why isn't it a problem already? We've got, I don't know what the exact number is, maybe 40% of the public have IRAs and 401ks. They pick up a telephone, they can move the money from their equity account to a fixed income account or back. They don't seem to do it. There's no tax barrier from stopping them from doing it. Uh, maybe they've all 
learned about efficient markets and figure that uh, by the time they know the news, there's no reason to move, and so they don't move. I don't know what it is that creates the inertia, but whatever the problems are, they're there now. Uh, and I don't see that what we want to do is say, well, let's not have a bigger capital stock for fear that people will move money around. I don't, just doesn't strike me as a problem to worry about. Thank you. Um, no doubt there will be people who would be happy to stand on the sidelines and say, if the little savers get nervous, we'll come in. In fact, this last time around when the market fell a few uh, weeks ago, the little guy was very comfortable, just stayed there, said, I've seen markets go down, I'm in it for the long run. Uh, I like the mix that I have between stocks and other things, and I'm going to hang in there. So uh, well, there's no evidence that with all, all the mobility of capital, of financial capital that now exists, that uh, there's any kind of panic selling of equities. Yes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Powell. I'm a first year here. My question is, what do you project is the impact of your proposed um, tax credit on revenues for the government and then on spending and then, I guess, on balancing the budget in the future? What it would do, what it would cost is about eight-tenths of a percent of GDP. And the projected budget surpluses of the administration and the CBO, um, starting in about three years and running for about a decade, a decade and a half after that, they haven't come out with the long-term projections yet, uh, are about 1 percent of GDP. So over that period, the existing projected surpluses would be largely absorbed in this way. And then it comes back to the question that I discussed with the fellow over here. What's the counterfactual? What would have happened if we didn't do this with it? Uh, would we really have saved it and had big surpluses? And I think the answer to that is almost certainly no. What happens after 15 years? Because you still then have this obligation. Uh, well, 15 years is a long time into the future. But I think it means that you either have to raise taxes or cut spending or run budget deficits, or maybe the world will be very different. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in 15 years. But I like the idea of moving us in part into this box. I think it's a box that people are going to like. As they begin to have accounts like that, they may say, why don't we move our DB plan over here, a little more transparency, see what we're, how we're doing. Uh, I think all that would be a good thing. Professor, my name is Dan Rundy. I'm a first year here at the Kennedy School. Uh, our group has been looking at a plan uh, in light of the uh, experience in Chile, whereby there has been these very expensive administrative costs and looking at ways to reduce those administrative costs. And one uh, suggestion that, or one idea that we've come up with is to pool the, um, the monies that would come in through this 2 percent, or in our case, a 5 percent uh, additional uh, tax, if you will, uh, collected by the Social Security Administration, then dispersed in lump sums to various ma money managers, and in our case, we think 20, and where they, they select from a very conservative uh, investment mix, say 80 percent or 75 percent bonds and 25 percent or 20 percent equities, and can, we came up with a number of return of about 5 percent as well, where the defined contribution would be to the effect that you put in your 2 percent or your 5 percent, and that's your defined contribution, but that there are uniform returns in the sense that the returns over these 20 money managers are blended together, and, and by contracting it out through the Social Security Administration, that way you could reduce the administrative costs. Well, I think there are two separate sets of issues. One is to what extent you want to pool the investment management, and the other is how do you collect the money. And I believe more in uh, letting many flowers bloom, uh, m many different investment managers subject to various kinds of prudential regulations offer their products. Uh, 25 years ago, we didn't have index funds. Uh, we didn't have uh, funds that um, changed over time between equities and debt and so on. So I'd like to let the vanguards, the fidelities, the, the various, the city corps of the world all come in and compete uh, rather than have the Social Security Administration pick out 20 and say, we're going to pool all of your returns and everybody's going to get the same plain vanilla return. I think the, the more important administrative issue that doesn't raise any of those problems is how do you collect the money? 
And I think what would happen under the kind of scheme that I've described is there would probably be three routes. People who work for large firms that already have 401k plans would find that the employers offered a payroll withholding. They said, we've got the following options here at Harvard for your 401k or 403b plan. You can use that for your personal retirement account. Second, anybody could opt out of that, or if you worked for a small employer, you would have the option of going to an individual, opening up an individual retirement account. You go to the bank on the corner, you open it up, the banks are all selling mutual funds now. So it's very easy. A third route in for the people who don't get it together to do either of those would be when you get your income tax form, your 1040, there'd be the line on it in which you have to say, where did you send your money so we can give you a tax credit? And if you say, well, I haven't sent it any place, but I'd like it to go to Bank Boston here on the corner, or I'd like it to go to Schwab, or I don't know what the heck I want to do with it, well, in the first two cases, they would send it there, and you'd get your credit. So, in effect, you'd never see the credit, you'd never pay the money, they would do it all. That's like your Social Security uh, administration plan, only it doesn't add another burden on the already overworked Social Security administration. So it's done through the the tax withholding in the same way. For those who don't do it through a, uh, a payroll withholding or an IRA route. And for the people who say, I just don't know what to do, who leave it blank, then there would be the federal thrift plan. That would be the kind of default option for people who hadn't otherwise specified a choice. Thank you. Last question, Jeff, so if you're it. Mm. My name is Eberto Taracena. Uh, well, even though the senator yesterday said that it was out of fashion to discuss things in relation with income distribution, well, my question is in relation with income distribution. Uh, now that you, uh, about your proposal of uh, this additional 2% uh, tax that goes to a personal savings account, uh, because this is going to be upset by uh, decreases in income taxes, uh, well, it, it seems to me that the higher your contribution, the higher the benefit that you get from the government. Well, clearly in absolute terms, the higher the benefit uh, that, low in that high income people will have and the lower the benefit the low income people will have. Uh, well, an alternative idea and thinking a little bit more than uh, just a two week assignment is like, why don't we take that projected surplus, divide it, by the total number of working people and make the government to make the commitment to put that X amount into everyone in the individual's account. So in that way, we will benefit in proportional terms a little bit, a little bit more to low-income people and high-income people. You could do that. That is, what my proposal is equivalent to is taking two percentage points off the payroll tax for everybody. So that if you make $50,000, you save 2% of what you otherwise would have paid on the 50000 And if you make 25000 you save 2% of the 25000 And the alternative that you suggest, that we take the surplus and say it's going to be $1,000 per person, or whatever the number works out to be, roughly $1,000 or $800 per person, regardless of your income, as long as you earn something. Why not do that? Uh, it would have favorable distributional uh, aspects, uh, but it would do nothing for marginal tax rates. So right now, everybody is facing, especially the low-wage worker, the payroll tax is the big thing they face. So if you're below the level at which you pay any income tax, you're facing uh, almost 8% payroll tax. This would eliminate two percentage points of that. So in terms of labor market distortions, you get something by changing the marginal tax rates that you don't otherwise get. So it's the traditional issue. Do we want to reduce marginal tax rates and get the favorable incentive effects, or do we want to have a lump sum grant to everybody, in which case we can distribute it in a way that you might like better, but then you don't get any of the incentive, favorable incentive effects? You could do something in between. You could imagine something that said, everybody gets to do one plus $500. Yeah. 
there's nothing magic about the 2% except simplicity, as I described it, and that it sort of maximizes the favorable impact on marginal tax rates. Good. Well, I enjoyed this very much. Good luck with the rest of the project. Thank you.